of Ramsey Solutions. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Number one best-selling author George Camel is my co-host today. His book is Breaking Free from Broke. He's a Ramsey personality. And we're going to be answering your questions about your life and your money. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Letitia starts this hour in Charlotte, North Carolina. Hi, Letitia. How are you? Hi, Dave. Hi, George. I'm great. How are you? Better than we deserve. What's up? All right. Well, I'm in an interesting situation that I kind of feel I already know the answer to, but... Hearing it from you guys definitely will, will make it make more sense. So I found you about six months ago and did your entire total money makeover book and started immediately implementing the baby steps. Um, paid off about $10,000 in consumer debt over the course of credit cards and a car loan. Good for and you. And what is – thank you. And what is remaining now are – my student loans, um, and I got my bachelor's as well as my master's, and it amounted to about one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So, what's your um, master's in? I, I got my MBA. Good. So, what do you make? Yes. So, I make about one twenty. That's good news. Yeah, yeah, so big, big shovel, but big big debt um, simultaneously. And I did what everybody did sort of pre-COVID, like right before it hit, and God offered the opportunity for them to consolidate it. And my mom said that makes perfect sense because over the course of, you know, seven years between my undergrad and my graduate degree, it was like 14 different loans between subsidized and unsubsidized. So um, right now they are consolidated down into two. So I've got 51,000 of subsidized and 110 of unsubsidized. And you're single? And, uh, no, I'm married. You're married. What's your husband make? Yeah. At um, like 7580. Oh, so you have a $200,000 household income. Yes. What other debts do you all have? Um, like he's got a car for his son and I am about two months away from paying off my daughters. Um, so we've got, you know, 20 and, and 17 year old kids. Um, so those will both be paid off here this summer. Mm -hmm. Um, so then the only thing. Okay. So if you make $200,000 a year and you have $160,000 problem, and yeah. you paid eighty thousand on it. That would live. Have you live household living on one twenty, not counting taxes, and you'd be debt free in two years, right? Those numbers sound great when you say them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you make two hundred. I've got you living on one twenty minus taxes. Mm-hmm. And that's that's less than you've been living on ever. Yes. In recent memory, so yeah. you know, I'm pretty much boiling your lifestyle down to nothing. What's your question, Letitia? Well, so we are currently renting, and I obviously, like, the goal is to buy our first home. And we're a little bit older, so I'm 42 and my husband's 45, um, so it would be like a first-time home buying situation. And what we currently pay in our lease, I feel like we could do in a mortgage and actually, you know, own own the home instead of just renting. But I know, like, just from listening to the show, the idea of taking out a $200,000 mortgage on top of $160,000 in student loan debt doesn't make much sense. But I worried about trying to prolong getting a house if I fully, fully waited until the student loans were were paid off. If you're going to take 20 years to pay them off, that might be a discussion, but you should pay them off in two years. Two years. And okay. then the emergency fund and then the down payment. And so we're, we're saying this is going to delay it, but you weren't ready to buy a house mm -hmm. today anyways. You guys don't have any money. Do you have any money in savings? Yes. How much? Um, so I've 
got about 10000 Okay. Have you guys combined and bank accounts? No. How long have you been married? Two years. Okay. His, his kid's car, your kid's car, they're still separate discussions. You're still living two yeah. separate lives. So we're yeah. gonna we're gonna always recommend because the data shows us this is data driven that couples that combine their money and work together towards a goal have a huge increase in probability of actually hitting that goal. That goal being mm-hmm. getting a house, building wealth, um, having a real solid nest egg, all of those things. Trying to do it as two separate individuals acting as roommates, it very seldom occurs statistically that's a data thing Mm -hmm. so we're going to have you guys combine that and so we have two kids with cars we got to clean up and then we have my student loan debt that we need to clean up so we can buy a house and that's what we would do so george's george's got a he's he's got his nose to the ground he's figuring out what's really going on over there i'm scruff mcgruff over here yeah oh my god just wanted to throw back to that dave this is like Ugh. that was an '80s throwback there, an '80s reference. Not as young as you thought. I'm telling you, you're getting older every day. Mm. But the uh, yeah, that um, that's what we would do. And, and I'm going to tell you to really lean in, and both of you, the faster you get this cleaned up, the faster you're on your way to not only home ownership but wealth building in general. And so I'm going to absolutely go crazy for two years, and and have this done in two years. Because 120 minus taxes, stop your 401k temporarily during that time. Don't do anything. $1,000 is baby step one. Everything else goes towards this. We're going to attack, 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 attack. And the two of you working together. Right now, you've been kind of working this, and he's been standing over on the side watching you do it. So we're changing the whole discussion, not just simply answering the one question. And as you guys budget $200,000 of income, it changes the numbers. It changes how much margin you have to throw at this debt. And I think largely it's felt like a solo journey trying to tackle this debt, making 120. Yeah. And it's, that's not a fun way to go. And so marriage, it's we. You got to change the pronouns here and start looking at this thing as a singular goal we're attacking together. Yeah, Jade says have a vocab rehab. Oh, I like that. That's pretty good. She's much cooler than you and me. Yeah, I, I got to work on my rhymes. We, we I'm not ha- there yet. We got to hang around with Jade. I'm mentioning get... Scruff McGruff. Jade's cool. out here with vocab rehab. Yeah, well, there. That's Gosh. my point exactly, right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, back to the data, Dave. Uh, back to the data. It does. It's true. Couples build wealth faster when they combine their life, their goals, their vision, their bank accounts, their budget. It's just a better way to live. Yeah, but I saw on TikTok that women ought to protect themselves. Oh, my goodness. See, there's several problems with that statement. Number one, you were on TikTok. That just right there, that defines a whole lot of, that tells us a whole lot about you right then. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey guys, you know this, but I'll say it anyway. College is freaking expensive, and student loans are out of control. The average private student loan debt in 2023 was $55,000. So if you're in over your head with private student loan debt, don't beat yourself up. Look, we've all made mistakes with money in the past. What matters is doing something about it now. So if you're in distress with private student loans, that's private, not federal student loans, call Y Refi. Y Refi refinances defaulted private student loans that other places won't touch and gives you a custom loan built for you based on your ability to pay. To learn more about this custom refinancing option, call 844-2-RAMSEY or go to yrefi.com slash Ramsey.
George Campbell, Ramsey personality, is my co-host. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Elizabeth is in Charleston, South Carolina. Hi, Elizabeth. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi. How are you today, Dave? Better than I deserve. What's up? Okay. Well, I worked very, very hard to get where I'm at. Um, I met my husband in my early 20s, and I had about 20 store credit cards and 6 k in debt, and she helped me get out of that. Uh, we worked super hard, saved every dime, didn't go on vacations for decades, um, put a lot of money towards the mortgages. Now we live in a great area, our dream house, great location, but I literally have no idea how much money we have, and we're still not going on vacation or living life, and I'm just a smart person that's doing really dumb decisions by not finding this information out, and every time I ask, it's not going anywhere, and it's not that I don't trust him because he's very, very good with money. It's just... I think we're going overboard in what we were doing, and I don't know how to kind of get out of this mm-hmm. merry-go-round of just my head stuck well, in the well, sand. Well, why is it that he won't share with his wife the money that you have? I just never, in the beginning, because I was the one in debt coming into the marriage. How long have you been married? 20 years. I've been married 43. If the stuff <laughs> I did stupid in the first seven years of marriage was still counted against me, I probably wouldn't be alive. <laughs> I, know. I know. I know. So I don't, you know, what what you did 20 years ago doesn't count. Why is it that 20 years into your marriage, you don't know what's going on with the money? Why does he not think you're worthy of that? Probably because I haven't pushed it. You know, every time I push it, he just doesn't want to get into it. And I just kind of back off and then... I don't fight it, and I'm to the point where I have to know this stuff. If something happened to him, I would have to know how to pay the mortgage. Okay. So how, how can we help you? How do I get out of this? I don't know if it's a mindset I'm stuck in or if it's just I'm scared. I just kind of want to get out of this the hold of just not knowing. Well, I guess... I mean, I don't want to be a smart aleck or anything, but the way you get out of the hole of not knowing is you start knowing, which means Bozo's going to have to open up his mouth and tell you what the flip's going on, and you're going to have to demand it as a part of him continuing to live. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, dude, I'm going to duct tape you to the bed and beat you with a baseball bat. You're going to tell me what the flip's going on here, okay? I'm kidding. Don't do that. But, I mean, you you, you really are – you sound sweet and you sound so apologetic like you've done something wrong for asking about your life, and you don't owe anybody an apology for that. Uh, You don't need to be a jerk about it, but you do need to lean in hard enough that he decides he's going to share with you and say, listen, I am terrified because I do not know what's going on. It's not okay that I don't know what's going on. And starting right now, I'm going to know what's going on or we're going to have other problems in this house. Okay. Can you find that much roar in your voice? Yes. It's just, I can't. It's like a five-year-old that throws a fit. You know, he goes into that mode. And yeah, you sound like someone who's been uh, who's the subject of domestic abuse. The way you're verbal verbalizing it, like it's all your fault that he's misbehaving. I think it's the way I grew up with money. Um, I'm the youngest of five kids, and there's a huge age difference between me and my siblings. And yeah, how old are my you? Grand- I am 47. Okay, it's time to grow up then. Yeah. I don't yeah, give a I crap what happened when you were a kid. Yeah. As of yeah. right now, you're like a 47-year-old grown woman. And he needs to grow okay. up, too. And, yeah, walk in there and say, Bubba, this ain't going this way anymore. We're not doing this. Not happening. Okay. You've told us that you trust him, but the truth is I don't think he trusts you. If he's yeah, not willing to I share think. any of this and be transparent with you, there's a bigger problem on his side. Yeah, and he, he, he enjoys no one questioning his decisions. <laughs> is he controlling in other areas, too? Just like stupid stuff like restaurants we go to, we don't like the same food. So you know, I don't think that's stupid. Come... Eating okay. is something we do a lot of three times yeah, a day if yeah. you're normal. Yeah. 
So, so I, don't, I think like you don't get a vote in this marriage in every other area, and that's not okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I live where I w- always dreamed of, and, um, you know. There's a difference between I, I, having a vote and being a kept woman. Yeah. You, well, you're kind of tired of being also. a kept woman is why you call. Yeah. Well, I wish I was a kept woman. I make my own money and, you know, contribute to the household. So, I mean, it'd be nice if. You know, you're kind of missing the point, darling. Yeah, I know. Okay, I know. so are you gonna are you going to sit down with him and deal with your marriage issue or not? Yes. Okay, good. I'm proud of you. And if if he absolutely refuses to share with you what's going on in the finances, when you point blank demand that as a, as an equal share in this marriage, then you guys need to go see a marriage counseling. To which Bozo's not going to go, and you get to go by yourself and learn how to how how to speak Bozo, and that's what the marriage counselor will do. They teach you how to speak that. So I know that that's a fun way to put it. Well, I mean, they teach you how to come back and do the confrontation and and give you, you know, because basically what we're talking about here is a boundaries violation. And the first thing that happens when someone violates your boundaries, whoever we are, our friend, Dr. Henry Cloud, of course, wrote the consummate book on that boundaries. But you feel like you did something wrong. You feel crazy. But you're now called gaslighting. That's the new term for this. When yeah. they make you feel like the crazy one and you're the problem. Yeah. And that's typically when the boundaries are being violated, that's what's going on. And it's an abuse mechanism. And, and it, it's a manipulation. And, and so, you know, I feel like I did something wrong. But then, the, but what happens is when you get in the presence of a coach or a counselor or you call us, you know, we're going to come alongside you and go, uh, by the way, you're not crazy. So, as a matter of fact, what they're doing is crazy. So, you need to step back up on that boundary again. And this time, you need to stand on it and not get pushed off of it with gaslighting, manipulation, whatever it is, right? And so, uh, but but this open, guys, it, it, it <laughs> this is coming up more and more and more. And Rachel and uh, Dr. John Deloney are doing the money and marriage event in the fall, and they're they're going. They're, they're both have gone down a rabbit hole on this research that's out there right now. There's fresh research in, but it's old. It's an old subject. I saw the research, similar research 30 years ago, but the, we used to call it the marriage advantage because the statistics were that a single man did not prosper financially in his career, um, in his health, his health that wasn't as good a, as a married man and uh the the idea being that relationships are good for you good relationships not toxic ones and the idea being that when you have something to work for for your family you're serving someone it changes your demeanor it changes your character you lean in you 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 prosper for good reason because you know when you got kids and dogs and stuff you know bills to pay all of a sudden it, it's different it gives than, you some purpose yeah and, and so there was a mar- there was what we used to call the marriage advantage well now we're seeing it and they're calling it all kinds of different things but we're seeing the exact same data is still there we found it again when we did all the millionaire research with all the millionaires we found that that the couple that is married and has a healthy marriage relationship, meaning that they both have, are speaking into the decisions, they're both speaking into the future dreams, they're both speaking into the sacrifices and prices that have to be paid to get to those dreams, they're speaking into major purchases, they're speaking into major giving decisions, and and the ones that do that together, who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies, the heart of her husband safely trusts her her and he will have no lack of gain huh gentlemen you want no lack of gain virtuous wife listen to her now lot wives larry burkett used to remind us that that does not give you permission to become the holy spirit that's his job so a virtuous wife understands that and so it's you know thoughtful wise input into life You live longer, better, and you prosper more. It's a pretty dumb formula, but it's kind of obvious. This is The Ramsey Show. Your home is probably the biggest purchase you'll ever make. And with the real estate market like it is now, you'll need a mortgage company you can trust. That's Churchill Mortgage. 
You guys, buying a home is not a button push. It's a process. It takes building a relationship with an expert who will dig into the details and give you peace of mind without busting your budget. Churchill is one of the highest rated lenders in the country and they're Ramsey trusted because they do what's right for you. Go to churchillmortgage.com to get started. Break Free From Broke? Well, you would get the book Breaking Free From Broke then by my co-host today, George Camel, Ramsey Personality, number one best-selling author. Very cool. And uh, Ken Coleman has been helping people do better at their work and do work in different places so they make more money and have a better quality life. He's been doing that for quite a while. He's one of our Ramsey personalities. He's had a couple of number one bestsellers, and he developed a, several, a couple of years back a an assessment called the Get Clear Career Assessment. The Get Clear Career Assessment. Now, what it does is it helps you figure out what you're good at, what you love doing, and then it starts molding that into a process and starts pointing you in some possible ways. You have never taken an assessment like this. It is powerful i took it and i'm obviously settled in my career and i was it was very interesting how it, it just completely we did such a good job with the assessment it it, figured, it reads your mail it, it, it read my mail that's exactly what it's it did pretty it's wild like, hey, dave you should be like in talk radio i mean it was like crazy but so um the get clear assessment has had about almost a hundred thousand people take it now it's on our website at ramseysolutions.com we are launching a new book with ken called find the work you're wired to do now it will have as a part of the book the get clear assessment as a matter of fact the book is a quick little read to help you understand and implement the get clear assessment so you get the assessment with the book and it shows you exactly how to do everything the book actually comes out in may it's on pre-sale right now and uh, again you'll get the audio book and the uh, ebook with it which means you're going to end up with three codes to do three different assessments so you can give it to friends and family that'll be pretty cool and um and it's a great bargain when you do all that together you can pick this up anywhere books are sold but you can certainly get it at ramseysolutions.com april the 16th the day after dreaded tax day Rachel Cruz is coming out with her second children's book. Her first one was I'm Glad for What I Have About Contentment. This one is I'm Glad for Where I Am. Great bedtime stories. And this is about gratitude. Because we have found that as you teach children gratitude and contentment, uh, those are the antidotes to entitlement. Go figure. Um. Humility is coming next. Get ready. But, yeah, the I don't know if it is or not, but probably. And uh, so it kind of all falls in the same bucket, right? Children that know how to say please and thank you and don't think that they are the center of the universe. They don't think the axis of the world runs through the top of their sweet little heads. These are children that become prosperous adults. And um, because everybody wants to be around them as opposed to the guy or gal who at a party is a taker rather than a giver. Mm. And so – I'm glad for where I am. The latest in the series by Rachel Cruz comes out. Beautifully Both of these are in pre-sale the right now. Yeah, you need to steal that for your baby. I do. I got a seven-month-old little girl, and these are the problems I'm having, Dave. How do I not destroy this kid? How do I not raise an entitled brat in this wild digital age? And so I'm excited to read this to her uh, every every now and then, just to remind her what Aunt Rachel I got said. It. Daniel's little boy's four. I got it out. Papa Dave, read. Papa Dave, read. Papa Dave, read. Oh, well, that's Don't fun. get me started. I'll definitely read to you because we know that children that are read to, their intelligence level goes way up so always be reading to your kids especially if it's a good kids book like there this. you go so check and out so all those books it's exciting it. times around here the junior books have been selling very well for decades but these books by rachel are just they're the world-class uh, illustrations as well laura just did an incredible lauren did an incredible job with that so so george changing gears from a sweet little kids book that you can get pre-sale at ramseysolutions.com to a not-so-sweet story. Something a little more sinister, if you will. Sinister. <laughs> that was good. That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. You've got that villain thing down, Dave. A little scary how good that was. FTX co-founder Sam 
Brinkman fried in so many ways, sentenced to, <laughs> it's freed probably, but I love fried better. Fried is, uh, yeah. Fried is a, sentenced to 25 years in prison for his misbehavior with the old Bitcoin. So this was the former cryptocurrency billionaire co-founded and led as CEO FTX, which famously collapsed back in 2022, 25 years behind bars for his role in perpetrating one of the largest financial crimes in U.S. history. He was convicted of seven counts of fraud, conspiracy, and money laundering, along with other charges of conspiracy to commit commodities and securities fraud at the ripe age of 32. If he you, went from if, you la- if you launder Bitcoin, does it rust? Is this like if a tree falls in the forest, riddle? This is a thought, yeah. I mean, when I put other coins in the the laundry, Uh, they rust, you know. It was never really money. It was never really there. Oh, that's right. It was just air. Who knew? Nothing happened. This is wild. This conviction last fall followed the startling 2022 collapse of FTX. Why was it startling? We predicted it. The cryptocurrency trading platform he had co-founded and led as CEO amid an $8 billion shortfall in funds. Oops. $8 billion. Oops. That's a lot. Just, oh, it's a shortfall. Is that what we call it? Oh, yeah. It's called 23 years in jail. At trial, he was accused of using depositor money to prop up his struggling hedge fund. No kidding. As well as using the funds to buy luxury properties in the Caribbean and make donations to a range of causes. FTX, which was mainly the Democratic Party. Uh, the FTX was one of the second largest crypto exchange in the world, allowing users to buy and sell dozens of virtual currencies. His wealth was estimated at more than $30 billion. The collapse Ooh. of cryptocurrency prices clip crippled FTX and exposed the shortfall of $8 billion. Yeah, so when the tide goes out, you can tell who is skinny dipping. Love that. That's what happened, right? So, so he oops. took people's money to invest, claiming it was still there, but instead he was funneling it into crypto and keeping a little bit on hand in case people wanted to withdraw. Then when crypto bit the dust... Everyone frantically tried to withdraw. The money's not there. George, and it all collapsed on itself. George, the, the advantage of crypto is it's not regulated I thought by it was the on the government. blockchain, man. It's, it's not the government, man. It's like it's off the grid, man. There's no regulation on it, man. It's, it's the advantage. Dave, you would like crypto because it's like you don't like the government, man. And Right, man? Isn't that how it works, man? Well, guess what? Dumb butt. When you have zero regulations and a guy's supposed to be treating something like a bank and instead he goes and buys his own stuff with your money, there's no regulations on it. There's no guidelines. There's no oversight. I, I, listen, I don't want the government uh, doing checkups on m- my body parts either, but I'll just tell you, I this is... This is, you know, it's the exact thing that makes crypto as, as a stupid idea easy to outline here because it didn't have any government oversight, man. It's like, cool, dude. It's like you, you're sticking it to the man. And yeah, well, this is what you get. You go to real prison. You don't go to prison in the metaverse here, Dave. You actually go to real <laughs> prison. It's not an MTF <laughs> prison cell. I wonder oh if he can sell NTFs of his prison cell. That would be something else. That might be his way out. It's, it's not a way out, but it's a way to make tokens. somebody money while he's in there. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I guess, you know, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. That's the that's the uh, the motto here today. Oh, my gosh. Sam was not a ruthless financial serial killer who set out every morning to hurt people. That's his defense lawyer. Yeah. Oh, Mikoski boy. described his client as an awkward math nerd. You're just a sweet kid, Dave. He's just a sweet kid. He just stole eight billion. He tried to return the money. He used eight billion of other people's money to buy him stuff, and sweet kid didn't know that it wasn't his money. He didn't know that he, you know, he just used eight billion of other people's money to buy him some stuff. Yeah, that's offensive to that's awkward math nerds. That's just a sweet math nerd. I mean, all the awkward math nerds in America and around the world ought to rise up and not be put in this category, because you know, he he. You know, it's amazing how he's actually devoid of ethics is what it amounts to. He's actually has, he's like a psychopath. Mm. I mean, he probably is a sweet kid. I mean, in all honesty, I have no idea. I've never met the guy. But I, I, you know, I wouldn't doubt it that he's a sweet kid. But he's just completely on a psychopathic, on a psychopath level, devoid of ethics. Led to grifting. It probably, he's so far astray from normal human function that he probably didn't occur to him he was stealing people's money. Hmm. 
Mm. That's how stupid and sad this is. And here's what's really stupid and sad. Some of you thought it was awesome to put money in there. You remember Matt Damon? Fortune favors the bold. Don't you remember the commercial for if for for? It was a crypto.com crypto. for that crypto, one. Crypto, crypto, yeah. Oh my God. Fortune favors the bold. Well, sometimes boldness gets you in prison for 25 years. <laughs> Sorry. There it is. Ding ding. This is the Ramsey Show. Hey guys, I've told you before about Christian Healthcare Ministries, a health cost sharing ministry, but listen to Jenna, a CHM member. She says, one of my biggest concerns about entrepreneurship and motherhood was figuring out how to take care of our health expenses. But we have found a solution that works for us in an incredible way. She loves that with CHM, she can help other families who need it and receive help back when her own family has an eligible medical event. CHM has been a godsend for Jenna. That's her CHM story, and it could be yours. Learn more and join at chministries.org slash budget. George Campbell, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Thanks for joining us. James is with us in Chicago. Hi, James. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, how's it going? Better than I deserve. What's up? So I recently just discovered you guys' show last week, so I've been to watch probably 80 of your episodes on podcast. Wow! Um, I went over my... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I went over my debt, and I'm like probably $80,000 in debt. Mm-hmm. And I don't know one where to start because it's just so overwhelming to just like pick one and go with it. And then my other second question is I'm up for a new job that will triple the income that I make now. Yay. I'm scared to take it because I don't want to make poor financial decisions to end me up into where I am now. Money was never really talked about growing up. So all this is like all the $80,000 is like figuring out on my own type thing, if that makes sense. Wow. So how much do you make now and what will you make if you take this job? So currently right now between I have a full time job that I make it's um I think like thirty five thousand and then I have a PRN like part time job that I do like on the weekends that I've just finished training for that'll bring in an additional thirty thousand dollars. So I bring in roughly about sixty thousand dollars a year. If I take the new job, it'll increase my income to about uh, between one hundred and thirty and one hundred and fifty a year, and then I can just go down to one job and not have to have two jobs because my one job, the main, the new job I'm going it. to, I'll be traveling all the time. Yeah, what do you do? So I currently right now I work in investments at State Farm, and I'm a, um, a patient care tech at a hospital um, that I travel. Do I, I took a travel job for, the and tra- then the new job will work in the catastrophe department at State Farm. Oh, the catastrophe department. So you'll be traveling for mm-hmm. State Farm going to the disaster mm-hmm. areas and helping the folks there and issuing checks and so forth, right? Mm-hmm. Correct. Okay. And you're how old? 33. Okay. And what's your degree in? I don't have one. I'm. Are you I single? Classes away. Yeah, I'm single. I have a kid, though. Okay. All right. Are you, uh, is the child traveling with you or? You, you're, no, you're... she's 13. I just have visitation. I her. see. I see. Okay. All okay. right. So let, let's um, reframe this. If I were in your shoes, that's what I would want to do. Um, hmm. uh, let, let, I'm going I'm to just make up something bizarre, which is not happening. Okay, but I, I'm going to pretend I was trying to. I was offered the opportunity to buy a company that was um, uh, an engineering firm. And I could Mm -hmm. buy it for one-third of what it's worth. Now, I have Mm -hmm. zero engineering knowledge. I've never run an engineering firm. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know squat about that. I could make a real mess with that. Do you you believe me? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
But if I could buy it for one third, then my new job would be to figure out enough about engineering to run the firm and enough about engineers and processes for running an engineer firm to, I would have to go to school, so to speak, not real school, but I mean, I'd have to, st- I'd, I'd have to learn all I could learn about engineering if I wanted to engage in this bargain that I've, I got in front of me. Does that make, you see what I'm doing? So you've got a mm-hmm. bargain that's in front of you, but in order for that to be a blessing, like buying an engineering firm at, at for one third of what it's worth, and again, it's just a stupid, bad metaphor, Brad. But if it's a bargain, but it's not a bargain if I go screw it up and bankrupt the thing because I don't know what I'm doing. And that's kind of your question. I I don't know if it's a bargain for me to get a bunch of money since I'm not good at it. So that means your job is not to not take the money. Your job is to go learn how to handle money. And you've been binge watching Ramsey, which is a good start. Mm-hmm. So you have a, you know, you're getting ready to come into some money. It made you nervous because it made you, it made you realize you don't know what you're doing. So let's, let's get you on a path to knowing what you're doing. Let's make you competent in this area so that this blessing is a blessing and not a curse, which is your fear. Right. I don't think you're going to destroy your life over this. And here's why I know you have the wisdom and self-awareness to call us going, I might destroy my life over this. Please help me not destroy my life. So part of it is pre-deciding you're going to do wise things with this money that you are going to be managing. I don't know. And the lack of knowledge scares me. That's a better statement than I'm a bad person. I'm going to screw this up. Because that reflects your character. And I don't think you're that guy. You don't. You may have made mistakes in the past. You know, if I was going to give you a nice car and you didn't know how to drive, it would be your job to learn how to drive. (laughs) Right. But it hadn't got anything to do with, I wrecked my dad's car when I was 13. Well, so what? You still can learn how to drive. Right. And that's what this is. So you're you're getting a vehicle at, at, you know, money that can take you some places that you couldn't go otherwise. And so you need to learn how to drive and we'll help you with that. That's what we do every day. And you, you know, that's the reason you've been watched. That's why you got really interested is I don't want to screw this up. I want to get better at it. I, I need to put some tools in my belt that aren't in there now for life. Is right. that, I, I think you, I, I'm with George. I don't think you're going to mess it up because you're asking the question. If you were arrogant and, and, and didn't know what you were doing, then that's a dangerous combination. But you're humble and don't know what you're doing. And that's a fabulous combination. That's an opportunity for growth. Right. And what I love about the baby steps in budgeting is it forces you to make a goal for your money. Because otherwise it disappears into stupid decisions like you're talking about. So the wonderful thing is this new income has a very specific goal. It's going to pay off $80,000 in debt. And so you're going to set an aggressive goal and say, all right, I'm going to make 130 after taxes. Let's call that 90. That's 7,500 a month. I want to pay this off in 18 months. Do they pay your travel and housing when you're on the road? So they cover, you get a, a company vehicle. You, they pay, um, they give you, um, the, was it the stipend? I think it's what it's called when they pay for all your food. Is that in addition to the 90? Hotel. Or in addition yeah. to the 130, I'm sorry? Yeah. Okay, so, most of it's made so basically you can almost live income. free as a single guy and almost put all your income on this debt. Yeah, correct. It's amazing. So what if you could put six grand out of the seven towards this debt every month? I don't have I, – I I can do that when I – if I get accepted for the debt. I'm just – previously I've had been poor with money, and I when I – during COVID I made – like 150 grand during COVID, and I just I was, but I was also in a relationship. Where did you spend it? And I don't want to get bad relationship. Where did I? Was it on the relationship? relationship? Traveling, yeah, relationship traveling. Um, I ended up buying a new car that ended up being like a horrible deal. Then I thought yeah. I paid paid it off. So James, like, oh, 100 percent no. of the people listening to you right now, including George and I, have done stupid stuff with money. My only goal is to not do the same stupid thing twice. Exactly. And so you've got some stupid stuff already under your belt. You know what it looks like. New car, traveling, trying to trying to walk around, be something you're not in a relationship and using money to do that. You got those stupid things in your belt. You know what they look like. You won't do them again, hopefully. If you do them again, there's right. no hope for you. I mean, you got to stop doing <laughs> stupid stuff. But, but you're going to do new stupid stuff probably. I have done new stupid stuff over the years. And it's just, but so my, my stack of stupid stuff that's in my rearview mirror is just taller than yours.
Dave's innovative like that. He always finds new ways. <laughs> He's a genius. So we're going to put you through Financial Peace University and teach you how to handle money. And that includes putting you in the world's best budgeting app, the premium version of every dollar, which hooks to your bank and how it allows you to track every year, every one of your expenses. And I want you to treat the next year and a half to two years like a game that if you're a hundred percent debt free and have $50,000 in the bank at the end of the game, you win. And so you gamify okay. this and you just watch every penny in this budgeting app and every penny goes towards your game goal and the game is the game of life, and it's not the one with the little spinny wheel. And that was the little, a fun one. And the little get married and have little babies in your car thing. The game of remember that? Yeah, oh yeah, I love that game. Oh, well, and your original show was called the Money Game. That's true. That's true. Any it had any nothing correlation to do with the game of life? No, it didn't. It just was catchy. But yeah, that's um, so. James, you're going to be fine. And hey, as you're going along, if you need some help more than that, if you got another question, you call. We'll help you. It's what we do, man. And uh, FP so, will be that game changer for knowledge, though. Yeah, I think I think you if you'll just do what we teach you to do in there, it'll work, man. It's worked for 10 million people. This is the Ramsey Show. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual, amazing relationships. The phone number is 888-825-5225. George Camel, number one best-selling author of the book, Breaking Free from Broke, is my co-host today, Ramsey personality extraordinaire. Again, the phone number, 888-825-5225. Eric is in Chicago. Hi, Eric. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hello, Dave. Hello, George. How are you? Better than we deserve. What's up? So I had recently got married about a month ago. Congrats. And appreciate it. Um, so we have been pretty much on the same page financially. Uh, we want to combine everything. Uh, together, and I just want to make sure that I'm following the right steps when doing that. Uh, obviously, this is not something I've done before, and so yeah. Okay, cool. So, what are you combining exactly? Does she have a checking account? You have a checking account? How simple is this? So we, yes, we both have checking accounts. She has um, uh, considerable more investments than I do. Uh, she's been very good with her money. Um, and then we both have uh, houses currently as well um, that we bought separately when we were single. Um, and then we're essentially right now thinking about renting one of them while we're living in the other. Um, but we do still have mortgages on both of those houses. Mm. You guys have any debt? Outside of the have mortgages? No debt. Okay. No, only the two mortgages are only debt, which is really great. So when you're talking about combining finances, it's also how do we combine this real estate situation? We have her names on one mortgage indeed, your names on the other mortgage indeed? That's correct. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, don't I don't know Illinois law, but in most states, when you get married, your primary residence is automatically shared whether you change the name on the deed or not. Okay. Okay. And uh, the actual, the other residents um, doesn't matter. I'm more concerned than the names on the accounts. Number one, I, I would combine the operations of the household into one checking account. That's what you and Whitney yes. did when you got married. Yeah, right? and you actually don't need to shut down your account. You can turn your checking account into a joint checking account, and then she can 
close hers out and move or the money vice over. versa. Exactly. And even the name on the investments, I don't worry about the names on the titles of these things. I more worry about the way we start using our pronouns and that we are considering our rental house, our primary residence, instead of like, well, I can't talk about that house over there. That was his house before we got married. No, you get to talk about it. You're now married. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I can't talk about her investments. She was doing good with investments before we got married. No, it's now our investments. The preacher said, and now you are one. And the old, uh, the old wedding vows said, unto thee all my worldly goods I pledge. I mean, nobody says that stuff anymore. But Maybe that's, they should. But that's what you should be doing. And <laughs> so I don't care if you go change the names on the deeds. That's irrelevant to me unless it just makes somebody feel better. The only thing I do care about changing the name on is the checking account. Shut down one, dump everything in the other one. But, um, you know, we have um, uh, one mutual fund that is in Sharon's name only because it's some money that was given to her when a family member passed away. And she said, I want to put that in a mutual fund. So I just put it in a mutual fund in her name. I didn't think anything about it. But there's no question in the Ramsey household that everything that we have is ours in, in spirit. And, um, and so that's the, that's the main way I want you guys to start looking at it instead of like, you know, I feel guilty for the debt I brought in. Uh, I feel guilty that she brought in more in investments than I did. Uh, so I don't feel like I have the right to speak up into that. Oh, yeah, you're married. Yeah, we're, we're definitely combining our decision making. So you see what I'm saying? It's more the spirit and the decision making flow and the way we discuss it and the way we feel about it than the actual names on the deeds that 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 mm -hmm. propel people forward. You follow me? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that we both are on board and we want to get to that point. But, you know, you you definitely tell when we speak about it, we still say your house or my house yeah. and, and kind of getting out of that mentality, uh, you know, it, it, a little bit of time, maybe. Well, um, I mean, we still you know, we still say whose better. car are we taking to church? Your car? Mm -hmm. Are you taking your truck to church? You know, and so, but we both understand we both own it, and so, mm -hmm. you know, I I would never buy a car without my wife present. I would never buy her a car for sure without her present, and so on. You see what I'm saying? So it's it's the function more than it is the the label is, is, and mm -hmm. the spirit behind the function that I'm looking for, that's what causes people to prosper. It, it's not the technical retitling. But I think it'll take some time for you to say, to start saying ours and we instead of yours and mine. Mm -hmm. Now, if the dog goes, uh, you know, goes poop in the floor, it's definitely your dog. That's the key. <laughs> it's not our dog. I was told that this morning, so I'm just telling you. That's your dog. Your dog, <laughs> your dog tore that up. That your dog just right. tore that up. And I went, my dog? Why is it my dog? I want to tear something up. It's your job to clean but it up. That's it. So, but I mean, yeah. so my point is it never quite goes away. But, you, you know, if you work at it and you say our goal is to be a, a functioning unit, a great partnership, not one domineering or one shamed or one whatever toxic version. See, that's relational stuff as well as financial stuff. Is that making sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think kind of a follow-up question, too, is that since we both still have our mortgages on our houses, um, you know, selling one uh, and pulling the equity and putting it in the other would get us closer to not having a mortgage. Um, obviously, it's not something that we need to pay down uh, like consumer debt or anything. Um, I like it. Is that, that would that be something that would probably yeah. be the best idea? Of that? It will propel you forward in your wealth building more than keeping it. Okay. And because every, yeah, everybody that, thinks owning real estate's the answer to everything, it's uh, and I'm a huge advocate of real estate, but uh, mm -hmm. we know from the data that we've collected on millionaires that getting their re personal residence paid for, becoming a hundred percent debt free, was one of the huge arcs and the story that caused them to become a millionaire mathematically. And we know that. Okay. And so, um, you know, but you've just been married 20 minutes. So, you know, if you guys want right. to sit in this for a little bit and say, okay, we're going to visit that uh, decision next spring. 
mm-hmm. a year from now. We're gonna we're gonna rent it for a year, and we may have to clean it up a little bit after the renter to sell it. But it can't just gonna, be. Well, Dave said I should. Or if you're both just gung ho and you want to sell it, sell it. I don't care. But if it's uncomfortable for someone to do that, then you can sit on it a little bit. But the point still is moving in the right direction and having that alignment. That that's, will help you build wealth so fast. That's a big deal. How long did it take you and Whitney to get aligned? Oh, my God. Well, she worked here at the time, so it was a snap of a finger. Okay. We were lucky in that regard. Mm. She was smarter than me, better looking, and better with money. So So you were lucky in that regard. Okay. Yes. I'm catching on. All right. That's how that works. This is The Ramsey Show. Statistics show that half of Americans don't have enough life insurance or they don't have any at all. I don't understand this, John. Why don't people want to take care of their family? They think they're going to die or something? Well, I used to be one of those guys. I didn't even think about it. And one of my buddies said, hey, the only reason to not have life insurance is if you hate your wife and kids. And I immediately went and got term life insurance. That's a gut punch. And oh, you're telling me and for, for decades, Dave, I've sat across people who've lost a spouse. They've lost somebody important to them. Me and too. They don't know what to do next. Me right? too. I mean, it's you're going to have a crisis here, and you know you got two options while you're sitting and talking to a young widow. She's concerned about how she's going to invest all this money properly and not mess this up, or she's concerned how she's going to eat tomorrow. That's exactly. These are the right. two options. And term, take care of your dadgum family, man. Term life insurance can replace income, pay off debts, cover funeral expenses, so your family can actually have the opportunity to just be sad, yeah, to just miss you. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. It's saying I love you to your family, term life insurance. Jeff Zander and the team at Zander Insurance makes it easy and affordable. I've used them personally for 25 years. They're the only people I trust. Go to Xander.com or call 800-356-4282. George Campbell Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us. Every Dollar is our world-class budgeting app that helps you manage money the Ramsey way. It simply works wherever you are, iOS, Android, or online. You can start Every Dollar for free and immediately see where you stand with your money. You get organized, personalize your budget, stop overspending, and save more money. New to every dollar will show you a long-term financial roadmap, track your net worth, your debt-free date, your retirement date, your baby step progress, and more. And we're going to proactively coach you to build wealth and reach your goals. This app is taking over. Download the free app for iOS and Android, or if you just want to do it on desktop, go to everydollar.com and get started. It works. George, the number of people, it's like 10,000 a day are joining this. It's crazy wow. how it's blowing up. The, uh, the number of people uh, using this and starting to use it, brand new. This app has, um, you know, we've had it around, but we've added a bunch of features in the last 18 months. And the popularity of those features and just the idea of, Right now in America that I need to control my money with the budgeting process has caused this just to explode. That's so true. The financial roadmap is just one. We've got the paycheck planning tool. So for people who need to know, hey, am I going to run out of money before the end of the month? This will help you figure that out. And some people that that have the spouse or maybe they're that person who they are like, I don't want to budget. You're not budgeting just to budget to be a nerd. You're budgeting to accomplish. And you're not budgeting to punish your spouse. We are making a decision with our money like two grownups because we want to go somewhere. That's what this is. It's telling your money what to do instead of wondering where it went. That's all it is. I, it's not a, it's not, I don't, I don't really live on a budget. It's restrictive. No, it's grown up for you to tell your money what to do and to not, not to intentionally go into overdraft every month because you can't do sixth grade math. That's just being a grown up. And so uh, it's no, you know, a couple of years ago, the millennials, they're not cool anymore. That but hurts. you guys said adulting. Oh, that's right. 
Adulting, you can't say that. It's not cool anymore. You no. You made you sound cool if you said adulting about two years ago, three years ago. Now it's like you're well, just, Gen a, you're Z just makes a boomer fun of us. trying too hard now. Yeah. Now there's loud budgeting. Gen Z made that one up. Loud Have budgeting. Have you heard about that? It's, it's better just, than quiet quitting. Exactly. It's the opposite. And it's just loudly saying, I have boundaries with my money. I'm going to make a plan for my money. So Really? What you made cool 30 years ago is now cool go. again, Dave. Right. The trends come back around. It's probably on every dollar. If you want a loud budget, every dollar will do it. We could, we could turn up the volume, I'm saying. There we go. Rhonda is in Seattle. Hey, Rhonda, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. I appreciate it. Sure. What's up? So um, I wanted to ask some advice. Um, I've, over the last few years, uh, my husband and I have really been having a lot of trouble with keeping up with um, adjusting our withholdings every year. And, you know, we end up paying thousands of dollars um, come tax season, um, which is now. And um, again, this year we owe quite a bit. And um, I feel like I'm saving all year just in ex- in expectation of this huge tax well, Why are you not calculating your withholding correctly? I don't know. <laughs> what, what are you doing incorrectly? What are you doing incorrectly? Well, I think I just wasn't aware of how much I needed to do that. And I do feel stupid admitting this because no, that's okay. of it's okay. the importance of it. So, like, the, answer, oh, I so the answer to how do I stop doing that is to become aware? Right. Yes. And then, and then go calculate um, it, right? Yeah. 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 So um, te- I did technically, my speaking, technically yeah. speaking, here's your math, all right? Yeah. If you knew at the beginning of the year, in January, what your income is going to be approximately for the year and what your deductions are going to be approximately for the year, that you could calculate the exact amount of income tax you're going to owe in total. Does that make sense? Yes. And if you divide that into each paycheck, we know what should be withheld in the paychecks then. Yes. And so it's a sim. I mean, let's just be... Real basic. Let's say it's twenty four thousand dollars is your tax bill every year total. Yeah. Then your withholding should be two thousand a month. Right. And I think yeah, I think our problem is um it just the withholding doesn't keep up with No, it's all screwed up. Yeah. The IRS is incompetent. They tell you the number of deductions. My daughter, when she first got married, now she's married with kids now, but I'll never, for the first job, she came over and said, Dad, how many, how many deductions do I need to do? And we calculated out what her tax was going to be. She was a single lady out of college, not making a ton of money, and we had to claim seven deductions. Oh, my God. She had no deductions, but we had to claim seven deductions to create the proper withholding so that the proper amount was withheld, so, so that she didn't owe any tax and didn't end up short like you have, and so yeah. um, or, and, and didn't get a big refund either one. So, but that's dumb. I mean, so obviously their tables are screwed up, right? Right. So you can't really go on the IRS says you should have some. No, you got to actually say this is the amount of tax I owe. It's almost like you do your tax return a year early. Right. And that's the that's the most precise way to adjust it. Now, if you if you hadn't had the trouble you've had, it may it may be. But let's say if you had a steady thing for the last three years, you've gotten a th- around three thousand dollars that you've owed every year. Okay, mm-hmm. but nothing has really changed. Then we probably know we just need to adjust it by three thousand dollars a year, right? Two hundred fifty bucks a month. Okay. Right. Easier. <laughs> yeah. That's easier than going and doing your whole tax return and figuring out exactly what tax is owed because nothing has changed. But now if a bunch, if you got married, moved states, uh, income went up or down, bought a house. Had a kid. Had a kid. There's all kinds of stuff that can throw that off, right? In which case you would need to go and run your calculation. So what's okay. your household income, Rhonda? Um, it is a, um, this year, well, last year, it was about... 200 okay. combined. Um, and what's your husband do for a living? Um, he's got a federal um, government job, and then he's also got military Doing what? retirement. Um, Homeland Security. Okay. W- what do you do? Um, I work for the state. Doing what? So we both have government jobs. Um, I work for the court system. Okay. I'm trying to learn about you guys for a second before I made this suggestion. Because right. here's what I would do. 
it sounds to me, and you tell me if I'm wrong, okay? But uh-huh. it sounds like this whole thing just makes you want to throw up. All the time. <laughs> like, I just don't yeah. want to deal with it at all. And right. I, cause it, I, I, I'm afraid I'm not doing it right, and it scares the crap out of me, and I don't want to keep doing it right because I feel ashamed. And that's kind of what I think I'm hearing. And so yeah. if that's the case and I'm in your shoes, I'm just going to go get some help. You make 200 yeah. grand a year. Spend a little bit of money and go see an, a mm-hmm. tax professional. Go, uh-huh. to, go to Ramsey Solutions and click on ELP, Endorse Local Provider, for uh, some of the oh, tax okay. pros we have. Have them sit down and calculate this for you and tell you what to do. Oh, okay. Okay. And, the, okay. and make them show you the numbers. Don't just do it blind. Right. But right. that way you don't have to go, God, I don't even know where to start calculating this crap. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I don't want to do it wrong again. And I, I kind of hear all that. Yeah. And it's okay. Now, the trick anytime you're hiring somebody to help you because of that feeling is mm-hmm. to make sure you lean in enough to where you understand why they're telling you to do what you do. Right. You don't just blindly go, well, my tax guy told me. That's when you get screwed up, right? Yeah. So learn enough, but that that way you don't have to do it. It's worth a couple hundred bucks. Let somebody else do it for you. Yeah, definitely. I think yeah. that that's def- yeah, the other way to go. And I think just moving through the transitions of all the other things you mentioned, this is our first year without um, a dependent. And, um, you know, getting raises and I have a, I had a side job, um, yeah. and they didn't take hardly any, pretty much any federal taxes out. So I knew that I was going to have to save some out for that. So yeah. it, but in the end it's like, okay, still, <laughs> or you could and just adjust your withholding, part. you could just adjust your withholding at the state or at Homeland by the right. amount that the side job is generating. Right. Yes. And either way, as long as they're getting their money, they don't care. Right. So, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Have, have somebody help you calculate. Jump on RamseySolutions.com slash tax. I just went through this this weekend with my tax pro, and they showed me all the math and numbers, and it was super helpful to break it all down. So worth reaching out to a pro and have the peace of mind there and fully understand what's going on. I always see how much I'm paying. It just pisses me off. I would love to be your tax guy, Dave. That would be fun. Yeah, it's like you're doing taxes for the Grinch. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey guys, Ramsey Solutions started small and grew fast. Because of that rapid growth, there were times when our systems slowed us down. That's why we switched to NetSuite. It works for us and it'll help your business too. Whether you're starting on a card table like I did or you're well on your way to becoming a multi-million dollar company, NetSuite can scale with you and help you communicate and plan better. Because you know your day-to-day up and down and sideways, but accounting, analytics, and supply chain are on another level. So maybe you're just not tech savvy. That can be okay. NetSuite will help at your speed and whatever your situation. More than 37,000 companies use NetSuite to know their numbers and their business better. So check out NetSuite today and find out how they can help you become the business you want to be five or 30 years from now. And right now, you can download NetSuite's free KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance at NetSuite.com slash Ramsey. That's NetSuite.com slash Ramsey. George Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us. We're so glad you're here. Hey, thank you guys. We're seeing our numbers on Spotify and our numbers on Apple podcast. Our numbers on YouTube are all through the roof. Uh, We're one of the top rated shows in all of those venues and platforms, and it's because of you guys. We appreciate you listening, watching and sharing the show. If you want to help us out, Be proactive and click the follow button. Click the subscribe button. Be proactive and leave a nice five-star review. All this stuff affects the algorithms. It really does. We, you know, honestly, don't be mean or anything. We don't really need the affirmation, but it does affect whether these algorithms push the show forward when someone's searching stuff. So 
really it does help us a ton and um it's a big deal so and also if they got a share button on your platform use it or just tell people about it or click a link and send it to your friend and uh cut it out and cut and paste it and say this is a show you need to be watching this is information that's life-changing these guys are these guys and gals are fun and funny and helpful and those are the things we are sometimes we're mean but most of the time, it's just because we love you. Sometimes all at once. And it takes that to get your freaking attention. So You've been there you funny go. funny and mean at the same time. That's that's one of your trademark moves. What? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, Dave, David is in Phoenix. Hey, David, how are you? Hi, Dave. Hi, George. Thanks hey. for taking my call. Sure. How can we help? Um, Dave, got a question about um, a Roth conversion. Mm-hmm. Um, and trying to figure out whether or not that's something that would be right for me. I'm, uh, I'm 69, um, still working full time. I'll be working for a few more years. Um, I, I've got a self-directed traditional 401k, mm-hmm. um, and then a, a, a small um, traditional IRA. And again, just trying to figure out whether or not you know tax-wise it makes sense to. How, how much is in all of those? Those two uh, about 605,000. Okay. All right. And um, what will happen? Wh- what are you going to do with that money? That's 605000 in the next 20 years. Um, in the next 20 years, uh, well, when I stop working, probably in a few years, it'll just start uh, supplementing, you know, my, my, my you know, I've, I've got some retirement um, pensions, but it'll just supplement the money that we'll be li- living on. Okay. So. Here's why I'm asking, all right? Um, There's a couple of things that go into the answer of the math on this. The longer you're going to leave the money alone, the more sense it's going to make to convert it and go ahead and pay the taxes. It's not going to make any sense to convert it and pay the taxes out of those funds. Do you have an, let's take the 600K, it's maybe 200K in tax. Do you have 200K in addition that you would pay the tax with without, without messing with this? Yeah, we've got some other mutual funds and and things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, because if you just reduce it by the, let's say you reduce the six hundred uh, by the tax amount, and then it becomes tax free, it's an exact wash. It doesn't. There's no. There's no benefit to doing that. Uh, well, there's no benefit mathematically. Now, the long. If you pay the money outside. Number one. Then number two, the longer you leave it alone, the more it's going to make sense. Then there's two other factors for you to weave into whether you want to do this or not. One is you've got mandatory withdrawals on it now beginning at 72 and a half. Okay. Your uh, required minimum distributions, your RMDs, you're aware of that probably. Correct. It used to be 70 and a half. They just moved it to 72 and a half. Okay. So with a Roth, you don't have that. Gotcha. The second thing is when you die and you leave a traditional, the taxes will be paid by the person, the income tax on that account will be paid by the, by the person who inherits it. There's no inheritance tax on it, but the income tax will still be paid as if you, you will either pay the income tax when you pull it out or they will pay the income tax when you pull it out. If you leave a Roth to someone, there's no tax because there's no tax on a Roth. Okay, gotcha. So it's good for estate planning. It's good to not have to screw with the RMD. But if you're going to turn around and be using up the money in the next four or five years, it's probably probably not good. Right, right. Okay, okay. So w- w- could an idea be then, Dave, is to use – let's say I went ahead and did that. I, I retire in a few years, and, and I start I start living on the money that are in not in those – vehicles that are just in regular mutual funds yeah and then when those run out per se or what have you 10 years from now or whatever then start using the other money you could you could do that what's your total net worth um uh, 605 in the in the in the in those that i just mentioned and then seven hundred and twenty five thousand in in just regular mutual funds um your house paid for yes sir what's it worth Seven seven fifty or so. Okay, so you got about two two point one million dollar net worth. Okay, give or take. I mean, you may have some other assets we hadn't talked about, but that's that's about where we are. So, um, I'm sixty three. I will never touch my retirement account. I've got okay. 
plenty of other assets. So I have converted it all to Roth. So I don't have to screw with RMDs and my kids don't have to pay taxes on it. No RMD, no taxes. Okay. Because I'm not going to touch it. It's going to go to them. Gotcha. It's probably, you know, because I've got, I'm going to live off of other stuff. I've got a bunch of real estate. I've got a bunch of other income and so on. Right. So I'll right. never touch that stuff. So it's a pure estate planning and RMD play for me. So every year, my 401k here at the office, I have to match myself, uh, duh, but matching a 401k is required to be traditional. It cannot be Roth. And then I flip it to a Roth in December of every year. So I don't own a di- all a hundred percent of mine has been converted to Roth, but that's the reason because I'm never going to touch it. Okay. And so it's going to grow tax free. If I live like into my 90s and I'm 63, it's going to be millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, just that one account, right? Going to the kids right. completely tax-free. It's awesome. Okay, tax-free. Okay, gotcha. So okay. that's the way I'm looking at it. But again, if you're going to turn around and pay the taxes and by converting it. it and flip, turn and take the money right straight back out, it does. Uh, the math does not work. Don't do that. Doesn't make sense. Okay, gotcha. So that okay. that's the way I'm. That's why I'm trying to go through this, um, and. George, you know, that's what this is one of those things that has changed with me. It's not the advice has changed, but once I got to this age finally, I started doing this show at 32, right? Wow. So when I got to this age, we talked about Roth like it was some distant it thing. It was in sort the of clouds. hypothetical at that It's thing. out there in the mist somewhere. And now this stinking thing's staring me in the face, and I'm going, Yeah, but I did all this other stuff, right? And I don't even need the money. So I gotta start thinking about it even different yet again. Yeah. And so uh it turn, you know, we used to say convert it to Roth because it's going to grow tax-free and you'll have all that tax-free money when you get to retirement, which I do. I've got all that tax-free money. I, I'm 63. Well, I, can, I, came, you're still I can access it. Zero penalty, zero tax. I can get a hold of it right now if I want it, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, But why would I? It's growing for the next 20 years with zero tax on that growth. The Nowhere else got I can money. put it that yeah. it's going to do that for me or for them. And so it's changed my perspective of how important that tax-free thing is when you From a look legacy at it, estate plan. When you look at it through the lens of the estate tax or the RMD. Yeah. And for people wondering out there, should I be doing this? There's a certain spot in the baby steps we tell you that's the right point. It's not in baby steps one, two, three, even four. It's six, seven. It's once you have a paid-for house, then you can take the hit and pay the taxes on that. But before good, that, you good. should be focused on the home payoff. That's a very important clarification. 15% before that. We were talking to a multimillionaire baby step seven guy. And I just assumed everybody knew that. So you, you're just good, good clarification. I don't want people to go out there just converting left and right exactly. after hearing that call. That man's in a very different place. He's got a paid-for house. He's done the baby steps. Yeah, he's got no extra debt. money laying around. you got extra money laying around, and you're in your 40s, 50s, or 60s, and you're in baby step seven, and you want to advance your wealth. The way to do it is to get the government's hands off of a big block of it by converting it to Roth. And the RMDs, these required minimum distributions, the reason they they have those on traditional is because the government wants their tax money. Yeah, and yeah. they don't they don't get any tax money out of the Roth. It's done. You've already paid it. So they're going to get their money. They're going to get way. it out of your kid's hide or out of your hide with the RMD or when you take it out otherwise. So, yeah, you're, or when you convert it, they're going to get their money. So the traditional's going to be taxed. It's just a matter on who and when. And so you can control all of that with this conversion discussion. So uh, you can talk to one of our Smart Investor Pros, and they can help you do the calculations on this. Uh, go to RamseySolutions.com and click on Smart Investor and get somebody that we recommend in your area. If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. But something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything from design consultation to measuring and installation. 
Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Visit Blinds.com to get up to 45% off. That's Blinds.com. Rules and restrictions may apply. George Camel Ramsey personality is our co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Kyle is with us in Milwaukee. Hi, Kyle. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Sure. What's up? So uh, I have a quick question um, kind of that my wife and I have been brainstorming. Um, I took a job about a year ago that makes me commute 50 minutes one way, um, and this is kind of you know, um, causing a little conflict in work schedule with uh, her being a teacher and working first shift and me kind of working some days first and second shift, but most days just, you know, second shift. So we don't really see each other um, that much, but um, we're kind of in a pickle because we we do have a good deal um, in terms of, you know, expenses. Um, our rent is only like $400. Um, it's kind of a deal that we got when we, you know, moved in together during college. What, um, what do you make? Same price. What do I make? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we together make about 120. We bring in about 120. What do you make? Um, I make about 7,000 a month. She's a teacher. She makes about three. So about 10. Okay. 10, 10 and a if month. you were to move close to your work, how far is she from hers? Well, the thing is, she could get a different job. Since she's a teacher, she could get a job, um, you know, kind of in any city. You know, the the market for yeah, because she's not making you know, much. Teachers, no, she's not. So that's kind of the other the other thing. It's like she can be flexible with her job, and we can move closer here for time's sake. What's the difference in rent from where you are now to where work is? Yeah, that's actually that's actually a great question. Um, the closer you get to Milwaukee. Um, the more expensive it gets, you know, in terms of, um, you know, taxes and whatnot at the end of the year. So the difference would probably be, I mean, you know, going from 400 to like 1500 plus 2000 plus. You guys make 10 um, grand mortgage. That's the first month. Yeah. This doesn't seem like a big conundrum financially for you guys. No, I don't think it would be, but you know, I, I, I watch your show and whatnot too. And I'm like, you know, we're calculating everything and we're like in five years, if we just kept doing this, we could have like $300,000 in cash, um, saved up. We could purchase a home, um, straight up in cash. You know, we wouldn't have in five years, you would have 300,000, which is 60,000 a year. If you reduce that by 12,000 a year, that'd be 48,000 a year you're saving. So in five years, you'd have 250,000. Okay. Um, and that's not but, including you know, if you get a raise in the next five years or if she yeah. gets a better paying job. And so those are other factors that play into this. But so the, the fact that you have cheap – my point is the fact that you have cheap rent is not what's causing you to buy a house in five years. It's your incredible okay. savings rate. Yeah, we're pretty we're pretty frugal. I mean, we watch you, we watch, you know, Graham Steph- Stephan. And, yeah, that's you know, what that, that's things. what did. I mean, not Graham Stephan, he's great, but um, but he didn't do it. You did it. But you're you're frugal. That's my point is, fifty thousand, forty eight thousand, of the sixty a year you're talking about saving, has nothing to do with the rent. You yeah. you understood what I did? <clears throat> yeah. Three hundred divided by five is sixty. Minus twelve thousand for increasing a thousand dollars a month is forty eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So forty eight times five 
basically two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You're going to have instead of three hundred thousand. It makes a dent, and that's the that's the difference it. in the rent deal. So moving does not keep you from accomplishing that exact same goal, except that you're not going to buy a three hundred thousand dollar house for cash. You're going to buy a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house. But I'm saying you're right on track for all that. Um, yeah, that that's what I'm thinking. So I don't know. I don't know what uh, I know what we would do, but we um, we're weird uh, in a, in so many ways. Sharon and I, I, I have. Uh, never in my life had a long commute. And so, okay. I mean, this morning I drove eight minutes to the office. Oh. And he lives 15 minutes away. You do the math <laughs> how fast he was going down the interstate. But oh anyway, we, we, that that's also true. But the <laughs> but that, aside from my driving habits, the, the, uh, the chance I'm burning up two hours of my life a day is pretty close to zero. Yeah, that's the thing. You get so, your life back. My dad yeah, did this no, growing up, Kyle. He <laughs> drove an hour each way to work in outside of Boston, and it took a toll on him. I just talked to him the other day, and he said, man, you don't know what that did to me for 20 years doing that. And I don't think it's worth it. Yeah. I, if you can I, avoid I, it. I, okay. I would change something. At, at, you know, Now, I can, do, I can do it for a short period of time. I can do anything for a short period of time. We can embrace pain to have a greater outcome. That's an amazing thing. What you're talking about doing is, you know, we can put up with this if it gets us to our goal of paying cash for a house. I like the, your, your mindset with that. Um, and so the, but there's a lot of different things that could change. You could change jobs. You could change locations. You could change entire cities. You could change a lot of things. But, uh, but I'm doing some number of those variables to get my life back as a newly married guy that never sees his wife that's just that's hard yeah it, i'm, I'm a short commute guy that's so tough i wouldn't I, be able to do that and the i am a, not I am a complete wuss i have to have my home time well i think you'd have more road rage if you had a longer commute america doesn't need that right now dave we need healing you know, longer days on the road. It's, it's a, how, why just, are you it's saying I, have road road. I do not have road rage? I've driven behind you and in front of you. Both that has times nothing I was to do scared. with rage. It has to do with you being in the way. <laughs> My little Tesla Get car. Get out of the way. You and your little battery car move over. Get out of the way. And then you won't have a problem. You seen that, that you Mad know, Max a, Fury they, Road? They, there's a sign that says don't drive in the left lane if you're slow. Dang. There's a sign that says that, George. It can only go so fast it's on Get a battery. Get in the right lane. And then you don't have these problems. It's not a problem for me. I don't have any road rage at all. Mad Max I, Fury Road is a documentary about your driving. <laughs> that's that's not even a fictional movie. Fury Road. Fury Road. <laughs> they just filmed Dave driving and then CGI'd it with some actors. That's all it was. I have never flipped a soul off. And it's been 20 years since I flipped somebody off. I Turned mean, from I never to it was 20 years. Yeah, well, I had to I had to be honest. But I, no, I don't have road rage. I don't get mad. I drive fast, but I don't get mad. Thank I, you. I get frustrated with people like you in the wrong lane. But other than that, move your little battery car over. Oh, man. Those little battery cars are supposed to go fast. You could just push on that thing and make it go. I could take you in a race. I know you could. You probably could. You're too competitive. Yeah, you run fast. I've seen you run. So you're quick. You're quick oh, on your feet. You're that guy. That's fine. So if we don't hey guys, laugh, we cry. The deal is this, okay? There's always – it's a good discussion with Kyle in Milwaukee because there's always a trade-off in personal finance. Some of you are listening and going, I live in L.A. Everything's an hour commute. Just get on the 405. Now you're talking an hour right there. I mean, period. So I get it. I get it. I live in Nashville, so I'm spoiled as long as I don't try to go to Nashville, which now takes three times as much time because all you people from L.A. moved here. So uh, and the stinking place is now crowded. But anyway, the uh, but but, you know, I understand some of you a commute's a normal thing. That's OK. So I, I was saying I know what I would do, but that's not a, a financial principle. It's not a moral imperative that, that if he wants to do that, and, and it's fine with him, and it's fine with his wife, but he called because it wasn't fine. Mm. And so, but you get to make choices, and when you're making choices, there's always a trade-off. The choice is I'm going to drive a, I'm going to drive a not so great car, so later in my life I've got so stinking much money I can drive whatever I want to drive. I'm going to live like no one else, so that later I can live and give like no one else. When you say that, you're saying I'm making choices. And what we want you to do, more than just follow us blindly, is learn that principle of intentionality, because no one wins the Super Bowl on accident. 
No one has a great marriage accidentally. No one accidentally builds wealth. And so be very intentional and look at it and go, I'm going to make that trade for that result. And so in, we're saying, are we going to make a $1,000 a month trade to not have a two-hour commute? We're both saying we personally would. As long as it's a quarter of your take-home pay. No more than that on the exactly. rent. Exactly. There it you was. go. This is The Ramsey Show. Ramsey Solutions. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. The phone number here is 888-825-5225. George Camel, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author of the book Breaking Free from Broke, is my co-host today. Thanks for joining us. Alicia is with us in Chicago. Hi, Alicia. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my question, I've got about $3,000 in collections that me and my husband owe. Um, we have it negotiated down to about $1,500, roughly. Um, most of that is in writing. Some of it is not. The question is, I was going through some of that today, and while I was reading it, um, they were saying that they were going to report it on my credit report as um, paid in full with partial payment if I decide to do that, and then I'm going to owe taxes on some of it. Um, so I have the money to pay the full three thousand dollars. The question is, is that which which route would really honestly be better at the end of the day? Is to pay the full amount or to pay the partial payment? Pay the amount you've negotiated down to. Pay the amount. Uh, may I ask why? Sure, sure. Because technically they will. Send, they're supposed to send, and they don't always do it. A ten ninety nine for the difference. Okay, yep. so let's say that. Um, so you have a $1,500, you've negotiated the 3000 down to, so you've had $1,500 in debt forgiveness. Does that make sense? Yep. And debt yep. forgiveness on 1099 is taxable, and you would report it on your okay. tax return when you get a 1099 from them. And they're supposed to send a 1099 okay. to you and to the others. They don't usually do it. They usually just use that as a thing to mess with you. Um, uh, now, taxes... On fifteen hundred dollars, if you're in a thirty percent tax bracket, or five hundred bucks. So, okay. do we pay them an extra fifteen hundred to keep from paying five hundred? No. No, right. That's why okay. I said that. So that that's the math on it. Now, I will add to it. There's a different component, and that is a moral or a spiritual component where you're looking at it and you feel like, you know what, I owe that money. I should pay it. I've got the money. If that's the case, then you should pay the money on that basis, but not because of the threat of taxes. Okay. Now, what, so my dilemma is the fact of I was, I'm trying to clean up my credit out of a bad situation that me and my husband got ourselves into. Yeah. And as far as a credit position, which it doesn't even matter because it's all going to be considered a pay in full or a charge off anyways. Yeah. Both are a collection item. And both damage okay. your credit. One damages it more because you didn't pay the bill in full. But it's not certainly not the end of the world. Besides that, you don't need to be borrowing a bunch of dadgum money anyway, so you don't need credit. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Is that? Yeah. What would you need the credit for? Yeah. Do you guys have any other debt? Um, no, we don't have an uh, – well, I shouldn't say no. We do have a student loan debt of um, 
17,000 that needs to be paid off. And we have, we've started budgeting and we've started, we should have that cleared up by the end of the year this year Good. Um, is the way it's looking at. And we would like to, in two years, be able to buy a home. You will be. And then you will be. Two, year, two years okay. from now, none of this will, it'll be on there, but it won't count sufficiently against you to keep you from getting a home. Yeah, that's okay. not. It's not going to do exactly. enough. It's not going to do enough damage to keep you from getting home. Because I'm also guessing that if you're in this situation, you've got other bills that are already paid that were paid late. Um. Yeah. Yeah. And most yeah. of those, I've been able to work with them, and I've gotten them to take our like payments off of our record, except like one late payment. The rest of them, they have all absolutely agreed and said not a problem, and have taken those all off of our history. You better check and make sure that actually happened, because they they again don't follow through very well. That stuff is usually done by downloaded on by download computer files, and honestly, the people keying in the stuff are not that bright usually. So, I, you better check it. You better keep a constant watch on your credit bureau and see if all that's really happening or not. So, uh, which is good news for everybody. You ought to check your credit anyway, even if you're not going to be using it. You got to know what's on it. Make sure. Uh, you can mine, pull that mine's been at free. Z, mine's been at zero and frozen for decades now. As soon as they allowed you to freeze it, I froze it, and of course it was uh, zero for, because I haven't borrowed money in thirty plus years. So um, I just don't have any credit. And if you go to annualcreditreport.com, you can pull that for free once a year from all three credit bureaus. And I think it's wise to do that just to make sure yeah, there's no fraud. Especially in your situation like she's in. Yeah. Making sure there's no fraud and making sure there's nothing going on. Everything's accurate. Yeah. Even the uh, stuff that you did borrow yeah. on. In my case, I'm so far removed from that that it's not necessary for me to check it. But it is a good, it is a good exercise to check it or, you know, once a year. All three of them, yeah. too, because the different ones come up with. There's 52% of the credit bureaus reports have errors oh wow 36 percent have errors that are so egregious that they would keep you from getting a loan for the wrong reason or keep you from getting a home for the wrong reason a home loan which is yeah that's a big deal all right uh jeanette is in kenton ohio hi jeanette how are you hi i'm good i'm so excited to ask this question to this duo dave you're awesome you're the guy that started all and george camel i love smart money happy hour and you're just a human version of an exclamation point so. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Quite the compliment. Wow. So my question today really sort of changed my mind. I'm curious as to why I would need a financial advisor. My husband and I are in baby steps four, five, and six. We're working to pay off our house in the next three years. And I just, I have a hard time justifying an expense for somebody to tell me to do what I'm already doing. So I'm curious to know what you think about that. Well, why do you think George and I use one? I don't, I honestly don't know. I don't, I don't understand what they would tell me that's different than what I'm already doing. I found that when I have a third party looking a bird's eye view at my entire financial picture, they see a lot of things I don't and they live and breathe this stuff. So they're thinking about tax strategy, estate planning, giving strategy, ways to minimize taxes, uh, ways to maximize my investments. And so they're looking at things from a very different viewpoint than I have. It's not just, hey, can you help me pick a fund? Mm -hmm. And I can go pick a fund out of the 8,000 and do a pretty dead gum good job. I've, you know, been licensed in that. I've done that. I used to do that for a living, um, you know, and so it's I, I'm very competent and capable of doing it. It's certainly responsible enough to do it. Um, but what I don't have is I don't spend every day looking at mutual funds. Mm -hmm. Like the number of hours I spend looking at mutual funds in a given year is very small because I just buy stuff and keep it. I don't think that much about it. I look at my statements and I keep moving, but they're out there moving around in that forest all the time. And sometimes my guy will call me up and go, hey, there's this thing happening. You may or may not want to do it, but I just want you to know about it. And he teaches me something I didn't know before about mm -hmm. a particular fund or fund class or whatever. Again, it's and the, what we pay them is, is a very small amount to manage the existing account. It's There's not that much to it. I'm not paying somebody a big, huge annual fee. Uh, this is just, you know, we're paying, I pay them when I purchase. George pays them on the balance of his account. Rachel pays them on the balance of her account. She runs that managed funds process just like George does. So I think we think it's worth it. That's why we endorse Smart Vester Pros and why we use them personally. This is The Ramsey Show.
George Campbell Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us. Our live event season is in full swing. We've got three events coming up where you can go and be with us and experience the different Ramsey teachings live and in person. The big dog is the Total Money Makeover Weekend coming May 10th and 11th. Uh, it is almost sold out. You can still get tickets if you go ahead and do it. Uh, this two-day event is the ultimate motivator to get you fired up and get your friend, your spouse fired up, get everybody on the same page, get out of debt, become wealthy, be outrageously generous, have a total money makeover. George will be speaking, Jade, Rachel, uh, of course, Ken Coleman about how to get your income up, Dr. John Deloney about the effects of this on relationships and stress and how to win in these areas. We're going to give you the tools to win. We're going to walk you through these time-honored processes, and uh, it's a, a full-on experience. Lots of Q&A, lots of stuff happening over the whole weekend. It's here on the Ramsey campus, uh, and it's, you know, it's a Friday evening, all day Saturday. Come in a little early on Friday. Watch this show happen on the glass. There's Smart be- Money Happy Hour that night as well money happy hour is one of the things we do to kick it off that night and uh, it's one of the things there so you you definitely want to come to this may 10th and 11th go to ramseysolutions.com slash events and get your tickets george and i will be doing dave ramsey's investing essentials a two-night virtual event may 21st and 22nd where we're going to go through material we were working on some of it today polishing it up uh that i've really never taught it is um, my personal playbook on investing, including my real estate and what I do. I'm These days, my friends that I run with are typically, you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 million dollar net worth people. And what, what do they do? And, you know, what, what are real people that are real investors do, not some character on TikTok some trying to sell you something? 17-year-old on TikTok showing Living you how to do it. in their mother's basement, yeah. Yeah, the calculations you were walking us through in the meeting, Dave, I think is worth the price of admission alone. So if you want to really do this the right way, Dave's going to really show some stuff you've never talked about before on stage or on air. Yeah, well, I mean, even our content people are going, I've never even heard that. I'm, well, I don't teach it. I just do it. You know, so anyways, Dave Ramsey's Investing Essentials, May 21st, 22nd, tickets at RamseySolutions.com. And then this fall, October 24th and 26th, through the 26th, the Money and Marriage Getaway with Dr. John Deloney and Rachel Cruz. This, but those two together, this is fun. No question. This is a barrel of monkeys right there. I'm just telling you. They are going to – you have a blast laughing about your marriage, learning about your marriage. They get into stuff. Uh, this is adults only. I mean, we're going to – they get you. They they teach They're you what you need to know to win in marriage, and Dr. John is not ashamed to go there. So If they don't invite me to speak, I will pay to be there. That's how much I love this event. Oh, it's really good. It's really good. And we, we can we can probably get you a ticket. I know a guy. Yes. So there you go. That was my way in. RamseySolutions.com slash events. Check it out and watch and see what we're doing. Probably more coming soon. Lee is in Buffalo, New York. Hi, Lee. How are you? Hi, Dave. It's Thanks Leah. For asking. It's Leah, right? Leah. I'm sorry. I said yeah. it wrong. How can I help? It's okay. Um, okay. My husband just got terminated about two weeks ago. Wow. And we're oddly... We're oddly too calm about this, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a little thankful. <laughs> okay, what did he used to make? Okay, my husband was about 60000 Uh-huh, and what do you make? Um, I am a full-time student right now, finishing my associate's degree. So how are you eating? Pretty well, actually. <laughs> Where's the money Where's coming the from? Where's the money coming from for pretty well? Well, like I said, he just got terminated. Um, he is on a stipend until the end of May. Okay, a severance package? Yes, okay. very generous. Okay, through the end of May. So we've got two months almost yes. from today. What did he do? Uh, what, what did he do um, for he, a living, I mean? He was a warehouse supervisor. Why was he terminated suddenly? Okay, very odd. Um they were told that they were going down different paths and that the job um, was going in a different direction. Um, we were blindsided, um, completely out of the blue. So it's more of a layoff than a termination. 
permanent. <laughs> I know it's permanent, but a layoff is permanent. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't sound like he did anything wrong. I believe he didn't. Okay. Um, was there a lot of conflict a, and toxicity leading up to this? There was a lot of toxicity with a new boss who's been there about just over a year. He okay, was who doesn't from, have the chops to actually say why he fired your husband. Okay. Correct. So that's what it was. It was not, it was not we're going in a different direction. It's, I don't like you, you're fired, and I don't have the guts to tell you why. Yes. Okay. All right. So how long had your husband been there? Three years. Okay. Cool. All right. And so why are you so calm? Because you got this thing till May? I think that's the reason. I'm. We're both very oddly calm at this time. I don't know. I feel at peace with it. Mm-hmm. But I just, um, we've been following your program for 19 months. Mm-hmm. Paid off the majority of the debt. That Thank helps. goodness. That helps. Um, we do have one credit card. It's at 13. And we have one car, which is about 11. Okay. Besides the mortgage. Yeah, so I would do what you're suggesting and say we're going to put full stop on any total money makeover debt snowballing and just push okay. pause and pile up cash because we're right square in the middle of, of a storm, right? And yeah. then here, here's what I don't want. Here's what you've already done, and I don't like it, and I want I want to I want to encourage you to stop it. And that is, you, I, he came home and has grieved this, and is angry and hurt and wounded and betrayed and doesn't know what he did and all this for two weeks. I want him to go get a job now because if he gets a job like this week making as much or more money, this severance is a signing bonus. It ends up being a blessing that he got fired. Go right. get a job making 70 k this week. Okay. Go after it like your hair's on fire. <laughs> Okay. Because you could every day between now and the end of May that he gets a job, the sooner he gets it, the more your signing bonus is called severance that you didn't need. And the faster you're out of debt completely, and the faster you have a fully All of that money could be used to accelerate your debt snowball. You follow me? I do. Yeah, so don't be calm. Don't okay. be panicked. Don't be panicked, but be very fired up and wired up about, yay, I'm away from that twerp. I don't have to work there anymore. <laughs> let's go make more money, and let's do it right now. Okay. Yeah, don't wait till June. Now, I have one more question. We have about 15000 in liquid assets, mm-hmm. but we might be forced to take a to like withdraw from the 401k to cash it out. Why? Um, should we? Why? Uh, they've been very pushy about it. Um, the company is based out of a different country. Well, just take your 401k and roll it to an IRA. You don't take it out. To an IRA. Don't okay. withdraw. You want a direct rollover. Direct rollover. Yeah. Okay. You yeah, don't get, ever want to see the money. Yeah, get with one of the smart investor pros and just roll it. They can fill out the paperwork. They'll deal with the weird company stuff. And... Um, you know, you can get some basic information, but yeah, just roll that. You don't need to withdraw it and leave your liquid cash sitting there and pile up mo- as much liquid cash as you can. And your husband ought to be working like six jobs, uh, side gigs right now while he's looking for work and then go get work immediately. Let's create so much income in this 60 day period of time and a new job in the midst of it that this whole thing ends up being a blessing. And you look back and go, thank God he got fired by that toxic twerp. You know, that's a big deal. That's big. But mindset is when I get fired, the first thing I do is nothing. It's normal because you get knocked flat on your back. Mm. And I'm just saying, get up, get up, shake it off. Get up, get up, go, 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 go. And instead of like, um, I don't, know, don't put me back in, coach. That hurt. You know, and it's that's true. Though. Yeah. That's the way you feel. You get in this foggy haze. Yep. You got to snap out of it. pre exactly. This is The Ramsey Show.
Thank you for joining us, America. George Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Today's question comes from Mike in Washington. Here it is. We got, should I reduce the amount of car insurance coverage on an aging car? My car is eight years old and worth six to seven thousand. Should I keep all the, quote, bells and whistles or move towards a liability only type of plan? Well, what you would do if I were in your shoes is price it. Um, Sometimes the bells and whistles really aren't that expensive. Bells and whistles, in your case, you're calling collision, which replaces your car. So if you have a $7,000 car, do you have $50,000 in cash? If you don't, you need to keep collision because you need to be able to write a check and not touch your emergency fund and replace this car to self-insure. Now, I'm in a position financially I could self-insure through all of my vehicles easily. I choose not to because I looked at what it costs me to insure a car that's worth X. I spend Y. And I'm basically buying insurance, and it's worth it to me to do that. To transfer the risk. Yeah, exactly. The car is 50 grand. It costs you a grand for that coverage. It's worth the peace of mind for you to just pay the grand. It's a risk transfer. And it removes, in my case, some of the liability as well because the puts an attorney with the insurance company between me and an accident. And I imagine when the attorney sees the name Dave Ramsey, they get a little excited. Yeah, on the other side, yeah, that's that's they get really excited because oh, they 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 sometimes mistakenly think that means they're going to get something, and what they didn't really grasp was that really means they're in for the fight of their life. But anyway, so but that's the insurance company's problem, right? So, um, yeah, that's uh, in other words, I had. The one I remember the most, Mike, like this is I had an old Jeep we had down at the lake house, and it was about three thousand bucks. And I got, I thought, why do I keep collision on that? That's dumb. I got teenagers is one reason, but at that time, but um, and I looked up and I so I asked the insurance guy. I said, hey, why don't I drop collision? He goes, it's going to save you one hundred and fifty dollars a year. Mm. <laughs> They want to insure this worse than I don't want them to. So for 150, sold Go to the man it. in the green jacket. Yeah. yeah, I was just checking my numbers to see what my collision is out of my policy. It's about 50 percent of my premium is going toward collision. Okay, and on a six or seven thousand dollar car, it's not a lot of money. So you probably, unless you've got a big pile of money to self-insure, you need to keep the collision in place. Most likely, you're going to look and look at the trade-off, the dollars spent. Versus having the coverage, it usually is a good buy. It might be a hundred bucks, and you go, "All right, I'm willing now, to keep it." Now, if you got a super bad driving record, or I don't know what you're driving, you're driving some weird car that gets stolen all the time, or something like that, uh, like a Hyundai, or something like that. But yeah, I can't get a Hyundai covered right now. It's awful. And so, um, sorry, Hyundai, I didn't do it. Uh, you guys did when you built them where they could be stolen so easy. I've but heard about it. And I think Kias a, as well are yeah, very so easily stolen. Same company. Some yeah, same, same mess, yeah. Uh, so anyway, there's a theft problem on them for some reason. Um, well, I know the reason. I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to help with it. So anyway, the um, – yeah, look at – it, unless you got some kind of weird car situation, it's not going to cost you much to cover this. And when you actually look at the actual savings, you're going to go, it's not that much money. That's what I think you're going to do. That's what I did in most of the cases I've looked at. Catherine is in San Diego. Hi, Catherine. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Okay, so I'm waiting uh, for my final tax returns. Um, I hired a company to um, negotiate and get get all my taxes caught up. I ended up becoming self-employed back in 2015. However, um, it was, I've been learning a lot, unfortunately, the hard way, and my bookkeeping is a mess, and now I owe a lot of money, and I didn't know. You haven't know paid taxes since 2015? Uh, no, I paid, I, paid, I paid some, but not all of it. Mm. So How much do you think you're going to owe? Up, um, it's probably going to come out to about $50,000. $50,000. $50,000. Do you have any money? <clears throat> no, no say. I mean, I just got the thousand dollars, and yeah. I just started listening to you guys. What's your uh, What's your income? Steps. Um, it fluctuates, and it goes from thirty to fifty, 
And so um, you're still self-employed. This is a business you run. Yes. Yeah, this is a, a business that I run, and just for the last three years, it's it has stayed at fifty, um, and I'm working a part time job. What other debt do you have? I just uh, when my debt, I back in twenty twenty two, everything I, I didn't make much money, so. Um, I ended up accruing. I, I paid everything off, and then I started using credit cards again. So I'm back up at ten thousand in credit cards. So you have IRS debt of probably fifty, credit cards of ten. Anything else? Yeah, that's that's it. And then my regular rent, and those are my you know the necessities okay. of rent and food. And so you make fifty on a good year. You owe sixty. Mm-hmm. Let's put yeah. it that way. So we need is to your, get her in. Is your credit trashed? I beg your pardon. Is your credit trashed? No, I've been I've been keeping up with the payment. Do you own a home? No. Okay. And like I just had an accident um, two years ago. It was a brand new car that I was already like two payments away from paying it off, and then it got totaled. That was the bad year where I only made I think it was about I made like twenty two thousand that year. Mm. So um, when my car got totaled, um, that was it. And I luckily had bought another car um, that was cash. It's an old car. It's a good car. It's a Toyota. And um, for some reason, I just saw this person selling it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to buy it um, because you never know. And sure enough, the new car got totaled. So I've been driving my Toyota. And, of course, um, I'm not buying a new car until I can pay something cash. But you don't have any money. No. So the money enough. from the money from the insurance from the total car is gone. It's gone because it was paying the bills after um because like I said that was the bad year mm-hmm. where it, I had to use that money to keep up with the rent and to keep up with paying my Okay. The IRS is yeah. going to be penalizing you and taxing you until you get this 50k cleared. You can put it your guys that were working with you your tax folks can probably fairly easily negotiate a payment plan. It's going to be a substantial okay. payment until you get the 50 cleared. But that 50 is going to be with you a while if all, if you only make 50. So what mm-hmm. I would love to see you do is, I I doubt you can do it, but if your credit union will loan you the money to pay the IRS, I'd rather you owe the credit union than the IRS. It's less interest, and they're um, much easier to work with. They're more human. And so okay. I, I, I want to get the IRS out of your life as fast as you possibly can. Uh, but if you're going to be fooling with this for three or four years, and you may be if mm-hmm. you don't change your income, then mm-hmm. um, then we're just going to work a death snowball. We're going to clear these credit cards. and But I want you to fight to get your income up and try to add some more because, I mean, even five or $10,000 more than you're making now, a side hustle or whatever, uh, thrown at this 50, you can start chunking it and getting it away uh, and getting it done. And, of course, no more bleeding you got to get your books in order, and you got to stay current from this point forward so that you don't um, just trade old tax debt for new tax debt by not taking care of business again. So you really, really, really have to go in and, and have a healing in this area. And you might need to go, should I be running this business right now? Should I go get a full-time job working for someone else making even 25 30 bucks an hour would give you a raise compared to what you're making now? So that's an option to consider if this becomes too much. Yeah, or both. Yeah, I don't know what the business is, but If you both. can do the business and keep and, the 50K and, plus and a full-time job. go make job. a 50K, then, then you can clean this the up numbers. in like a year. You know, that kind of thing. So I, I'm going to be fighting and scratching and clawing to try to get my income up and to try to get the IRS out of my life as fast as I can if I'm in your shoes. This is The Ramsey Show.
Our scripture of the day, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. 1 John 3.18. C.S. Lewis said one of the most cowardly things ordinary people do is shut their eyes to facts. Ooh. Deb is in San Antonio. Hi, Deb. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hello. Hi. What's up? Yes, um, we have recently found out that our daughter is in need of prosthetic jawbone joint replacement on both sides of her face. Wow. And although she's in a tremendous amount of pain, our insurance company considers this a cosmetic procedure and they do not want to cover it. The part they will not cover uh, is in the ballpark area of $65,000. Wow. And we're wondering, what is your advice to people in this situation? We do not have an extra $65,000 hanging around. This wow. is a serious need. Mm -hmm. um, if how, we do how, not do how old, it. How old is your daughter? She's 22. Mm. How long has this been going on? Um, she started having a lot of pain about a year ago. So we went to an orthodontist. And they said, oh, there's a serious problem here. We're going to send you to a specialist. The specialist said, we think we can help, help you. We need to put you in braces for a year. That year came and went recently. And they reevaluated and said, oh, sweetheart, we can't help you. We need to send you to a different specialist. And so we recently saw that specialist who said, oh, dear, your choice is um, prosthetic child bone joint replacement. <laughs> Okay. Um, and you've seen only one person. We we saw the I mean, orthodontist you, the, here. The one specialist. The, you haven't gone and gotten a second, third opinion on this issue. Um, the specialist we saw locally it was very good. He said, you know, we can possibly fix this by splitting the upper $65,000 and you're going to take my jawbone off. I'm getting second, third, and fourth opinions. This is our third opinion. Um, no, it's the, the first opinion, and you liked it because you liked him, is what you just told me. Then you changed your story. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to explain it that way. Okay. We we feel very good that we're in good hands. We've talked with yeah. our orthodontist, our dentist, the specialist in our town, the specialist yeah. in the other town. I, I don't know who else to go you, to. You to went to a, a, a specialist in the same field in a different town. Um. And took her there, and he looked at her, she looked at it, and gave you the exact same diagnosis. Well, we have an MRI. We can look at it. Her jawbone right there is gone. Mm. Wow, what a horrible thing. I'm so sorry. Well, I just, yeah. the only thing I know, to, the only thing I, that we've had experience with is in the medical community is to always get uh, lots of different people looking at a problem that is as severe not just simply one that I like. Um, and it's, you, you've got one plus one looked at it out of town when you sent the MRI over. Um, if I were in your shoes, I'm, to answer you, you ask what we would do. What we would do is we would keep working the problem because there may be another solution that is insurable. Okay. I don't know. I don't know anything about this from a medical perspective. It's zero. I have no knowledge of it. But I'm just working a problem. I'm working a project here and an issue, and my baby's hurting, and I can hear her pain in your voice. And so, um, and I, I don't blame you for, for, you know, wanting that pain to go away. That's a good mom. So, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to figure out that. Then the second thing I'm going to do is it, let, let's say that you talk to uh, maybe two or three more people in, um, you're in, in San Antonio. So you're, you know, you're in Dallas and you're in Houston talking to people and, um, in personal visits and they're looking at it and saying, oh, and then you, you know, you ask around that community and you find I'm going to become a dadgum expert. If I'm in this situation over the next two months, if I'm if my baby's hurting in this situation, that I, I, I am I'm way too old and ornery to trust one doc on something okay. that's this that this that's this unusual. This is not a simple thing that happens every day to somebody. I've lived my whole life. I've never heard of it happening before today. So it's not very unusual. Would you agree with that? 
Yes. Okay. So that, that for that reason, I'm going to just keep researching. Then the second thing I'm going to do is once I have established for sure in my mind, and you may already have, you may not want to take that piece of advice. That's fine. That's okay. You, you ask what we would do. We're here to help you. We'll tell you what we would do. Um, once I've established that, that it is an absolute necessary situation, that it is not cosmetic, it's, the, it's a dadgum medical problem, then um, we're going to start talking more sternly uh, immediately to the insurance company. As a matter of fact, I may go ahead and start that conversation now to the point I might hire an attorney to make them provide the insurance money. So you might spend three or four or five thousand dollars on an attorney instead of spending sixty five thousand on the procedure and make the insurance company insure it. Because I don't know. I have no knowledge but I'm going to uh I, I don't accept the first answer from the doctor and I don't accept the first answer from the insurance company. I am cynical. I'm suspect of all of these people <laughs> until okay. I get this problem solved, okay? That I don't okay. mean that in a mean way. I'm just saying uh, until the problem is solved, they're part of the problem. Okay. And so the, and that's the way I'm fighting it. Uh, because I'm a warrior style yeah. person. Think about it this way, Deb. If I were to pay you $65,000 in order to fight this as your full-time job, would you do it? This is your full-time job. And so that's how I look at it. And uh, I was just doing some quick research online, and someone went through the same thing. And they said it was 50 k for all of this. It was a huge battle with insurance, but eventually most of that was covered. And they, again, had to fight. They said these surgeries are medical, not dental. So as long as you're you in that Where'd you find that? I just did some Googling, Dave. I'm very sleuth-like like that. Yeah. So there's stories I mean, out there. So the- I would connect with people who have been through this and ask them how they did it, how they fought it, uh, just to give you some hope that it can be done, but it's going to be a journey. Fighting yeah. insurance companies is not fun. Yeah. And so you got a, I guess, yeah. The, so that the reason for my cynicism is, let, let's be real blunt. You got a bad diagnosis or a bad um, treatment plan the first time. You and go to the orthodontist, spray a lot of money. Braces, honey, look, we spent a year in pain and, oh, didn't work, nothing, zero. So why do I, you know, and then he's going to recommend, well, I don't care what he recommends, because last thing he recommended sucked. So, I mean, I'm pretty much firing this guy. You know, I mean, that you don't get like three choices on this stuff. So, um, yeah, figure out what is, if it's the only way, and then yeah. what is the best way then, if it is when the When I was only a way. younger and less nice version of Dave, um, my wife was diagnosed before we had children uh, with uh, being pregnant. Oh, wow. We went and told everybody. A baby's on the way. We go in for the first thing. The OB goes, oh, I messed that up. And I went, dude, you got one job. How do you mess that Babies. up? Babies. And you mess up the baby job, you're fired. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, we'll be transferring her files somewhere else. Your whole thing you do is to find out if babies are coming and make them come. And you didn't make that happen. And, and you screwed that up. And I and now I got to go tell all my relatives no babies on the way. Ugh. Yeah, dude, you are so fired. And my wife's like, and I and I wasn't even that nice. Um, and Sharon's like, you embarrassed me. And I said, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, he embarrassed you. Well, what he, he did. She won't be seeing him uh, again. It's yeah. fine. So, yeah. Oops. Until yeah. you run into him at a grocery store 30 years later. That's why they call it practicing medicine. Yeah. That is scary. So um, we're just giving it our best shot. Yeah. So anyway, I, and we, and then we had a, obviously had three wonderful children later and had a wonderful OB experience. One guy took care of all of those. And he was right every time. family friends. So I'm not a perpetual jerk to all doctors. That's not the point. But um, if you've got one job, dude, one job. And you mess that one up. So that's yeah. two dreams today. I wanted to be your tax guy, just to see you irate, and I want to see. Uh, I want to be your your OB. Now. Your failed OB yeah. doc. Yep. Epic fail. Oh, Dave, never mind. I did not see. I thought I saw something. Epic never mind. failure. Epic failure. Golly. Yeah, I read the test panel wrong. Yeah. You flunked. When I happened in college, they got that's called an F. Yeah, out of there. Done. That puts uh, this hour in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus.